All right, guys. Sorry about that. Three minutes late. Not that bad. I had a couple things to take care of. So um, I was kind of a little bit stressed out. And Janet said, look, don't worry about it. You'll be three minutes late. It's not the end of the world. Um, trying to figure out where I'm supposed to be sitting here. There we go. Um, Mike's a little, everything's a little bit off when we first start these chats, but I want to thank you guys for being here. Thank you for tuning in. I see you guys. Facebook are here. Um, YouTube is here. That makes me real happy that this is now working, that I can actually go to two platforms at one time. That's was always problematic because I know people on Facebook want to chat and people on YouTube want to chat doing two different ones. is really, it's just not, not really practical. So today, um, again, I'm, I'm doing these chats a little differently. I want to ha have a topic to talk about. Q and A's are good, but a lot of times people check in, the questions kind of get lengthy. It gets a little overboard. And if you don't have questions, you don't tune in. But if there's a topic, a specific topic that's important to people, I notice more people tuning in. And um, a really important topic for me is rescue dogs. So you see, I'm kind of on this rampage um, with the training methodologies. Um, I have a lot of things I stand for, a lot of hills I'm willing to die on. And it's um, important that I explain to you why. Let me tell you why I started training dogs. I did not want to be a dog trainer. I didn't need a new job. I'm certainly glad I did it. But the reason I got into training dogs is I, I rescued a dog named Silly. And I loved that dog. I loved him very dearly. I love him like I love Goofy. What happened was I started to become more aware of rescue dogs and dogs that didn't have a place to go. And so I started going to the shelter. Now, as much as I love my purebred dogs, you know, we have two labs and a German Shepherd and a Malinois, all from breeders, all, you know, very purebred dogs. My love of dogs is greater than my lo love of any breed or any sport. And there's something that really interesting that um, I've said for years, and I see other people saying it now, and it makes me so happy. So a couple of trainers in Germany are saying it now. Love the dog more than the sport. You must, must, must love dogs before you can love a breed and before you can love a sport. So... A great example is I did um, IPO Schutzen for a few years with Goofy. And I found out Goofy really wasn't cut out for it. The training that I did at that time was not really a great standard. But and again, if I had known now what I knew then, sorry, if I had known then what I know now, um, Goofy would have done much better. But I saw he wasn't doing well, and everybody said, well, just get rid of him and get another dog that can do the sport. That's really common in the sports. Now, I'm not going to criticize sports today. But I'm going to say that there are also a lot of people in the sports who really care, God bless you, Goofy, who care about their dogs. And if you don't care, like if you're willing to buy a dog and it doesn't work out and you're going to get another dog and that doesn't work out and you're going to get another dog, that's not saying that you don't love dogs because you might love dogs, but you don't love that dog, right? Um I, you know, I think you learn those things when you form a really cohesive bond. And it's something that I really wasn't that conscious of till I got married, that when you have problems in, in a relationship, you work through them, right? And if you have a dog that's not exactly perfect, you work through that. And that's a really important thing. I guess you have the same thing when you have children, um, something I don't know anything about. But um, in marriage, just because something isn't working out, like you're like, oh, this is, uh, you know, we don't agree on that. My old self was all fine, and I'll just go be by myself or meet somebody else. But when you're in love, when that, that bond is that much deeper, then you go, well, you know what? I'm going to work through this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this work. And it's that exact kind of dedication. That's not going to be very popular with, with a lot of people, but it's that exact dedication that you should have to your animal, to your spouse, to your animal, to your children, and oftentimes to your friends, you know? But again, I didn't really, le I learned it with my dogs, but I never had it for people. I didn't care. But I learned it since Shannon and I got married, and she's going to hear this and then make fun of me later because I'm too sensitive. Anyway, so I got some notes. So you want to get a rescue dog. You go to the shelter. You go to the rescue. What do you do? How do you find the perfect, perfect rescue dog? And um, I, I made a couple notes, which I rarely, rarely do. But um, the first thing you're going to have to think about 
when you're looking at a rescue dog, let's take, for example, a shelter. And I spent more than, more than 12 years in shelters working very hard at getting dogs um, adopted, at understanding dogs, and at training dogs. And I know the personality of the dogs. There are a few rescues, I'm not going to say a lot, I'm just going to say a few, that will just try to pawn off a dog, just to get rid of a dog, and they will lie about the behaviors of the dog, the breed of the dog, the genetics of the dog, maybe even the health of the dog. Most rescues I know, and in fact, any rescue I've ever had anything to do with, would not do that. That is un unheard of. So um, you need to make sure that you really examine this, that you really look into knowing what is your limit, right? If you don't know your limits, you're going to get screwed. For example, some, you know, an elderly couple in their 70s goes to a shelter and end up walking out with a pit bull or end up walking out with a big German shepherd or end up walking out with, you know, you know a high drive border collie. Those are really not the right situation. So you need to know what is your limit. Now, by that same example, a person, a young person in their 20s or 30s or 40s might walk in and um, end up with, you know, an older bulldog and they want to go hiking and walking and doing all these things. That is the wrong dog. There's always the right dog. But you should know what are your limits. First of all, know your physical limits. Know what you can handle. Get a dog. Remember, when you get a big dog, as those dogs get older, Maya had um, a little issue a couple months back, and I needed to carry her. I needed to lift her up and down the stairs. I needed to be there for her. And if she was a 120-pound dog, I probably couldn't do it as well as I could do it with her. She's 60 pounds. Um, if you live in a house where it has stairs, if you live in an apartment building, understand that maybe an older dog might not be the best choice. Um, oftentimes, I always say that a dog, you know, a rescue dog, the average rescue dog you're going to find is probably going to be three to five, six years old. Those are perfect ages because the dogs are already socialized. The dogs are already um, uh, somewhat housebroken, we hope. Remember the lies that that go out there. Though the, the one of the lies, and I heard this from. There's a lot of big multi-million dollar organizations, right? I'm not going to mention their names. You watch TV and you'll know who they are. They're spending millions of dollars, and they're very. Uh, they're w part of this m movement called No Kill, and the No Kill idea, although on its surface is a really nice idea, it's a, it's a, it's a really noble cause. It's very very flawed. Because these multi, multi million dollar organizations give shelters more money if they kill less dogs this year than they killed the year before. So that encourages these shelters to not euthanize, to f try to get as many dogs as adopted as possible, but also to warehouse dogs. That means dogs that are dangerous, sick, that need to be euthanized, aren't being euthanized because they're trying to increase their numbers. Um, I like to ask a lot of questions because there's a lot of volunteers in shelters and volunteers know things about dogs that if you talk to them, really talk to them, you're going to get a lot of information. How active is this dog? How is this dog around other dogs? Have you seen this dog around other cats? Uh, have you seen this dog around smaller children? Also, a lot of <coughs> shelters have intake notes. On, on intake notes, they will ask questions like, did the dog live with children? Did the dog live with other animals? Was the dog walked on a leash? Was the dog, how was the dog in a car? Those are all things you want to ask. And those of you who are here today who are um, working in shelters, in rescues, these are things you should look at. Right? In my course, my online dog training course, the shelter dog training um, course I have, I talk about a lot of these things that really are beneficial to shelters and to, to, to trainers who work with shelter dogs. Um, I want to know... One, I can see the size of the dog, right? I can just see that from, from, from looking at the dog. But I want to see the energy level of a dog. In other words, I don't mind a dog that's a little bit bigger if it's a lower energy level. That's going to be really, really important. Um, that's, that, that, you know, that's, that's more prevalent to, to your situation. Like In other words, if you had a, a, bit, a little bit bigger dog, but it's low energy, you don't have to worry about it if you live in a smaller house or smaller yard or more in a, more in a suburban type and, or an urban type area. Um, I want to know things about the dog 
that I oftentimes will want to see because you know the right dog when you see the right dog. You really won't know until you experience the dog. So I like to get the dog out in the yard. I like to just hang out with it. Is the dog aloof? Is the dog just cut off in the in the corner of the yard, not paying attention to me? Will this dog engage with me? That's something I look for early on in puppies, but also in um, in a dog that I'm going to want to train or play with. That's going to be really, really important to me. And one of the things that people always ask me is they say, you know, um, and I talked about it in my podcast with Nino this week, earlier this week, and that was, is a rescue dog better than a purebred dog? Let's take that conversation for a second, because I think it's a really valid conversation. I think it's a really important thing to think about. And the answer is, neither is better, right? I've had a rescue dog, and you can get, a pure, you can get purebred rescue dogs, but the, it, they're rare. There was a thing that um, one of the big organizations, I'm not going to say the name again, said that more than 30% of the dogs in the shelters are purebred, and that's a lie. So before you want to make a decision, you should know the truth. First of all, if you get a mixed dog, it's got something else in it. For example, Bosman's a picture of him right above my monitor, up here by, by my camera, um, was a dachshund. But he had something else mixed in there, right? Something else snuck into the gene pool. But it made him an amazing, amazing dog. He was the best little dog, better than any just purebred dachshund ever, right? He was just perfect in his little ways because of his little mixed things. Um, but Janet originally went to go get a big dog because she had just lost Cleopatra, which was a Rhodesian Ridgeback that she bought from a breeder. Then that dog lasted a very long time. She was very much bonded to the dog. I knew the dog back in the day because when Janet and I were together, she had she had gotten Cleo. We, we were together when she got Cleo. And um, that's going back 25, 30 years. Um, then she ended up with Bob's, and Bob's was this little mix. Now, forget this idea that you go to the shelter and you're going to have, you know, 30% purebred dogs, and then some other, another head of one of these big organizations said, you know, the reason you want to get a dog from a shelter is because they're trained. They're already trained because the staff is training them. The staff is not training shelter dogs. It's absolutely not true because, first of all, there is few members of any staff in any shelter or humane society or uh, SPCA that has the skills to train dogs. Take it from me, I've trained many of them. Now, some humane societies will employ a staff behaviorist, right? And that person will basically, I can tell you, 99% of those people will be positive only trainers. And the, because, and the reason is not that, 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 other trainers don't want to do the job. They want to do the job. But if you're relying on public funding, you can't have somebody in there having a dog on a prong call or correcting because the political climate is so skewed now, that's not going to happen. So um, the dogs are not trained. You're, you're, at, at, you're lucky if you get a dog that can sit from, from the shelter. But again, it doesn't matter, right? So is a rescue dog better than a purebred? It, it, it doesn't matter. Yes, they are better. Yes, purebreds are better. So somebody says to me, is a purebred better than a rescue dog? I'll say yes. And I'll say, is a rescue dog better than a purebred? And I'll say yes. Because it depends, right? The real answer is it depends. What do you want to do with this dog? If you just want a pet to hang out, sit on the couch, watch TV, go for a couple of walks, and you can go to the shelter and get yourself a nice four or five-year-old dog that somebody gave up on, you're probably going to have a really nice dog. Now, Think about what you want to do. Now, if you want to do protection sports, you want to do hunting, you want to do agility or something like that, you're probably going to want to get a younger dog. You're going to probably want to get a dog that's cut out for the sport, both genetically and physically, right? So in other words, the drives of the dog should be there. That's really important because you don't want to put a square peg in a round hole. You're just going to beat your head against the wall. You want to do the right thing. You want to get a rescue dog. You want to help some uh, another dog, but you're... Diehard ambition is to um, to go to the Agility Nationals or something like that, or the, I, the IGP Nationals. Well, it, it more than likely is not going to happen, right? It, it's not going to happen because nobody who has a dog like that is going to give it up. Now, the rare chance there's one in a hundred, one in a thousand that you could find the dog that just it's too much drive. Like for example, there's a great organization called the National Search Dog Foundation, um, and I had two uh, representatives from the show, from them on the podcast. It's an amazing, amazing organization. One of my favorite organizations. Um, they comb, comb shelters all over the country trying to find dogs that will work for that. And they're looking for insane drive dogs. They're looking for the dogs 
that can't live in a house. They're just so insane for a toy that that's what they want. Um, you look at somebody like Zane Stoops, Steve, my, my, my brother from another mother, um, you know, is procur procuring dogs everywhere. And he is not going to go to a shelter because he knows that it's one in a million shot for him to get a dog out of there because of the temperament and drives they need. So when people tell you, oh, shelter dogs can do everything that rescue dogs can do, they can but not to the limit that it can be done. Like, in other words, they can't do it to the limit of being able to um, have these multiple abilities. So if you really want a nice dog, you want to go for walks, you're probably doing yourself a favor by getting a nice dog out of a shelter. But if you're looking for something more, you might need to consider getting a purebred dog, getting a, you know, going to a reputable um, breeder and doing that. But let's talk about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take questions here real shortly, so just bear with me for another couple of minutes, um, because I want to address your questions. It's a really important topic, but, um, and I'm going to probably go randomly through them, because a lot of you guys have been asking questions. I probably won't get to all of them, but I'm going to try to screen through, and Janet will probably screenshot a couple of good ones and give them to me. Um, I want you to think about your decision to get a rescue dog carefully, because here's what oftentimes happens. People go to the shelter, they feel sorry for the dog, they hear a sob story about the dog, they take the dog home, and then they can't handle the dog either. And then they put the dog back in the shelter. And that dog has a really crappy life going from a home to living on a concrete floor to back into a home and saying, oh my God, this is great, I do, I am, I am good, I get to go back in a home, they get love and they get the nice meal and they get the carpeting floors and sleeping inside and then suddenly they're back in the shelter. So it's critical that you understand that when you make that commitment, do your very best. I'm not saying it's going to always work out that way, but do your very best to make sure it's going to work out, right? Think about it. Go take the dog for a walk. Go play with the dog in the shelter. Come back the second day. Really try to figure that out if that's going to work. Now, the last thing I'm going to say um, on this topic here is you don't know and you will not know that dog until you live with it much like marriage you know the, you're not going to know everything about that being until you spend days and days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks and you see the dog in their good light and in their bad light in their good mood and in their bad mood in their happiness and in their sadness because people will say oh the dog's not aggressive at all but you get the dog home and suddenly the dog's aggressive or quite the opposite. And this I've seen quite a bit of times. The dog is not aggressive at all. There's no aggression in the dog, but you get the dog home and the dog is aggressive. So you need to understand that you will not know the dog. You will not know the personality of that dog until you live with it. So you need to make that commitment. I always say, Three months, six months, and nine months. Now, that's, that's for a puppy. Now, with a, with a rescue dog, I say three to six months. You will not know that dog for three to six months, and then you're going to start to figure him out. So I always tell you, if you get a rescue dog, impose a lot of structure. Put the dog in a crate when he first comes to you. Because if he's coming from a shelter, he's living in a kennel. If you can take that dog and put him in a crate when you get home, it's not that bad. But if you take the dog from the shelter, and this is what people always do, they say, oh my God, the poor dog was living in this horrible shelter and there's poop in his crate and I'm going to take the dog out and I'm going to give him the greatest life and he's going to get to run free in the yard and he's going to have the whole house. And then what happens is the dog tears up the couch, right? Or he pees in the closet. And then you say, well, I'm just going to put him in the laundry room. And then he chews up the, the baseboard in the laundry room. Then you're going to put him in a crate. So now he went from confinement to all this freedom, to horrible, tiny, tiny confinement. And that's cruel. That in of itself is cruel. And, you know, just a little plug here, because so many times people say, oh, e-collars are cruel, or correcting dogs is cruel, or prong collars is cruel. The very cruelest thing we do to dogs, the very cruelest thing, is abandonment. It's the cruelest thing. If you think of that, the worst thing we do to a prisoner when they go to jail is what? Solitary confinement, no contact. And that's what happens to dogs in shelters. They immediately either get thrown in a kennel with people they don't know, dogs they don't know, or 
they end up in a kennel all by themselves with a steel bar with people walking by, dogs walking by, and dogs across from them. They can't, they can't c- communicate. They can't um, be affectionate. They can't be bonding or anything like that. The shelter is the cruelest thing that we do to the dog. Now, a lot of shelters do a good job taking care of dogs. Some don't, but for the most part, they try. I think shelter employees are very, very undervalued. I think they're amazing people. They really try hard. There's a couple jerks, but they try hard. But the act of giving up on a dog is much crueler than training. And when you get that dog out of the shelter, impose the structure, impose the training that will equal the love that will keep them out of the shelter ever again. Ever again. That should be your goal. And you can do it through structure. But too much freedom, the dog will take advantage of it just by nature of being a dog, right? By nature of being a dog, the dog will try to take advantage of the situation and will manipulate the situation and will end up not being the great dog that it has the potential to be. When you take that dog out of the shelter and you bring him home, you've got a blank slate. That blank slate gives you the ability to do whatever that dog needs to save that dog's life. So based on that, guys, I'm going to look through and um, put my glasses on so I look very, very smart. Janet's going to come here and sit in front of me. Um, You didn't get to see her. Her head went right underneath the camera, but um, she's probably got some good questions for me. Um, I'm going to look through and see if I see any good questions. I'm going to start way at the back here. Um, By the way, if you have a question, okay, good. Pet Prep Radio Show. Um, for rescue puppies, at what age would you recommend introducing a prong or an e-collar months, of course? Well, first of all, I wonder if the dog needs it, right? I mean, first thing I do is I just start everything with a slip lead. That's always the most important. Um, whether it's a rescue dog or not, um, I always, the prong and the e-collar is always something that I would introduce after six months. For sure, I would probably say around nine months of age. That's usually my, my uh, basis for this is that I think they should be about that old. Um, Wolf Bite says, I am Belgian and I see a lot of mouths here in the local shelters. Heartbreaking. Any red flags to look for when visiting a dog looking for a lower dry dog? Um, you know, I talked about this with Nino, who's, who's Belgian, who's from your country. And I know in Belgium, here we're seeing more Malinois in the shelters too, because they're becoming, you know, the flavor of the month. Like pit bulls were the flavor of the month. German shepherds were the flavor of the month. Rottweilers were the flavor of the month. Now it's Malinois. Malinois don't do well in shelters. I can tell you that right now. It's not a good breed for, it's not a good situation for them. But because of um, their drives, you can take a Malinois out of a shelter and still enter a trial with them. You know, you can still get obedience on them. Look for the number one thing I look for in a dog that I don't like, and Stoops and I talked about it when we were looking at dogs he was selecting for for, um, his work, are spinners, right? Dogs that are spinning in the kennel. That's a sign that they're they're almost far gone. They're, they're kind of far gone. Once they start spinning in a shelter, uh, you know, in the kennel, I, um, I, I really try to watch. I, I, that's what I don't like. Um, you know, I mean, you'll see a calm dog. You'll see a calm dog. They'll get up, they'll bark, they'll do whatever. Um, but first of all, you know, lower drive mouths are very rare. If you're training in ring work, um, if you're training in ring work, I don't think you want a lower drive mouth. I think you want a higher drive mouth because ring work does require a lot. And I don't know if you're doing Belgian ring or French ring or, or, or Mondial ring, but um, I do think they, um, they all, all need. Oh, I see. You're, you're, there's somebody else answering. Thank you for that answer there. Um, okay. I, I'm going to see. Jan has got a question. Which one? Huh? Naomi says, I got a rescue dog, and now I'm really going to hear some food aggression. Any advice on the handless behavior? Yeah. Food aggression is always dealt with, um, I try to hand feed the dog. You know, that means I take the, I, I only feed the dog from hand. You have to determine what the food aggression is. If the food aggression is human related, in other words, if the dog is going after you, you got a big problem. You need to probably, in this case, I would recommend working with a trainer. But um, I would consider very seriously hand feeding. If you can, if the dog takes food from your hand, it doesn't bite. I would only hand feed the dog for quite some time. And then you'll start to see, you can drop, I've got videos on it. Um, drop the food in the crate, um, uh, in the bowl, feed the dog in the crate, take the, you know, put your hand in the bowl, but it, it takes a long, 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 long time. Um, here, I'm going to put questions up on the screen. Oh, that's God, that's so small. I don't know why it's so small. Let me make it a little bigger. Let me take this one here, honey. I'm going to get to that one one second. Bill says, Hey, Robert, do you still crate your dogs throughout the day or do you let them free roam around? Oh, all our dogs free roam around the house. Um, I usually do that at about a year to two. Up to a year, it's, my dogs are not crated 24 hours a day. 
I put them in the crate when I'm not paying attention to them. When I'm sitting in the, in the office, I might tether them, have them close to me. I might take them out in the yard. They get a lot more engagement when they're that age because they need to see that. But they also get a lot more alone time, time that they just should spend just chilling out in the crate. Because like now, I can tell you where my dogs are. I'm not going to even look. But Goofy and Maya are over there. Jimmy's on that chair, and Maya's on her bed over there. Am I right? One, two, three. Spot on. I know where my dogs are because they get into routines and I like routines. Routines work for me. They make me feel safe because I'm a little bit obsessive and, and, and you know, high drive. And um, it works for dogs because it makes them feel safe. So, yeah, I, I like them in, in crates. I don't think they need to be in a crate if they're not, you know, um, too young. But it's really, really important. Did you have one for me? Who? ZZ. Oh, OK. So I got the same one here. OK. Where um, I am right now, it's hard to find a good trainer. Is it possible to train a dog myself using something like your videos or there's some secrets? No, I mean, I th and it's continued. I don't know. Um, oh, so um, can I, as an owner, provide that? Yes. I mean, 90% of, 90% plus of training uh, a dog can be done with stuff you can find online. Again, I'm not the only great trainer online. I mean, I think my stuff is really good. Um, but there are other trainers. There's this. I, I think there's a handful of, of good training thing online from what I've seen. And I've seen a lot. There's probably three or four that I like. Um, and mine is one of them. I think mine's the top one. <laughs> but um, yeah, because what you're trying to do, you're trying to build a bond with the dog. You're trying to build engagement with the dog. You're not trying to tame a wild lion. I mean, you're just trying to take a dog that's already been genetically predisposed to bonding with humans over thousands of years of evolution. And you're just trying to communicate with them. And my videos you know, on my site, robertcabral.com, as well as here on YouTube, are amazing. And if you're looking to be a dog trainer, there's some really great resources as well. Um, Travis says, what's wrong with using a prong collar when they're still a young puppy? Well, I'll tell you what, what's wrong with it. It's because, um, one, you're not going to be able to get the dog to respond or to understand it as well. I've got no problem with a prong collar. But as puppies, I like to let puppies... <clears throat> get away with a little bit, especially if I'm going to use the dog for a sport or I'm going to let the dog be a, a little bit more confident. As a puppy, I let them be a little bit naughty. I don't overcorrect puppies. Um, and putting a prong collar, I think, starts to just curb that, that, that drive a little bit. Uh, and that's it. I don't, I don't think it's cruel, but I just don't think it, if it depends what you want the dog to do and what you're expecting of that dog, um, it will help. It, it will help a lot to wait um let's see here's one from m fung fat or funga fat i don't know what that is adopted my german shepherd when he was six six four years ago okay there's a lot of a lot of numbers but i know what you're saying four years ago you adopted me you're six year old now he's 10 because you had six to four and you get 10 we do daily wood hikes off least three to five miles is that too much for him no i don't think so if he doesn't seem tired and he loves it no your dog will tell you you know um, dogs wander, you know, do wolves, if you think about as, 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 a, as, a, as a genotype, um, wander and they wa walk as long as you're not you know, pushing the dog and running or biking in the dog. Okay. Mr. Just a regular user says any suggestions how you would address a rescue dog with handler handling aggression. He's completely fine with everything except anyone trying to hold him or touch his head. A problem for vets muzzle. Well, you're going to need to muzzle him, but, um, you know, it, it depends how old this dog is. If the dog is already kind of, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, I kind of would just let it go. If the dog is younger, I would make handling a positive thing. If he's fine with everything except for trying to hold him, then start to, you know, hand feed him and pet him, hand feed him and touch him, hand feed him and reward him. Keep it really short. Like um, when I've worked with dogs, and there's some videos that I, I still need to post, actually. There's some in my shelter dog training course, my, my course for dog trainers. But... I'll just sit with a dog and I'll just touch him a little bit. And then if I see them get a little tense, I just kind of stop and just kind of hang out. As long as they, what the dog fears, that most dogs that are aggressive, most aggression comes because of a suspicion. And the suspicion is a fear of something worse happening. That's why dogs bite when they're cornered because they think something bad's going to happen. And it's why, you know, handling a dog or touching a dog or that confinement kind of freaks them out. So you need to make them okay with that handling because. That's the only way they're going to get over it. But you need to go really slow and you need to protect yourself. Um, Matthias says, um, 
E-collars will be banned from January 1st, 2027 in Belgium. I have no clue whatsoever how to train dogs off-leash without an e-collar. I would like to see the paws of only people with a rabbit or deer. You know, you guys in Europe really, I, I'll tell you something, in a way, I'm, I, I, love, I love you guys, but you screwed yourselves. You know, you capitulated. You said, oh, you know, we don't need that, we don't need this. This is a problem, right? And this is why I'm telling people in the rest of the world where it's not banned yet to stand up and fight. So when people, the first thing that comes down, they go, well, you know, people who have e-calls, yeah, you're right. You know, they should have it. They should have a, they should have to be licensed. It starts with this little bit of capitulation and that's it. The animal radicals, the, not the animal welfare people, but the animal rights people, the people who don't want vegan, they want vegan leather seats and vegan shoes and vegan hamburgers and all that stuff. I get it. I mean, I feel bad. I got to kill a cow to eat it, but I didn't invent the system. I'm just living the system. All this stuff ends up being proven to be unhealthy. It's unhealthy to feed a dog a vegan dog food. It's unhealthy for humans to be vegan, uh, despite all the BS studies they've shown you. Um, it's unhealthy for dogs not to be trained. And uh, yeah, yeah, you're not going to have dogs off leash anymore. And when they get off leash and they can't be trained and they're biting other dogs or they're not coming back and they're getting hit by cars, Every one of these politicians who voted for this should have the blood smeared on their hands and on their faces for the death and the misery they're causing. I'm so sorry, Matthias, you're, Matthias, you're going through this. It's really, really obnoxious. It's sick. What am I looking at? Sparky. Hi, Robert. I have a six-year-old golden retriever. She has solid obedience in the house. Now I want to start training her in a park. Any tips on how to deal with the distractions? Yeah, deal with them. You know, the way you're going to deal with them is you're going to um, get the dog in front of distraction. I'll give you a great example. Yesterday, Goofy, uh, Maya, Dwayne, and I went to the park, and Janet joined us later. And, you know, I got there, and immediately a guy has his white little fluffy dog, comes out of the car, bolts, you know, right around my car, and I'm about to take Goofy out. What a better distraction, right? Now, Goofy is already really well trained. I had Dwayne out, other dogs were around, and then I took Maya out. And some lady had a little, like a real cute pit box or mix, um, throwing a ball. Now, she's on the phone with her little Apple earbuds and um, talking on the phone and with a chuck it, throwing the ball, which I, I detest that, right? I, I've got no problem with dogs off leash if they're under control. None. In fact, I like it because it allows me to train my dog under control. And my dog is off leash. So I had Maya. We were doing focus healing, focus healing. I had a ball, focus healing. I throw the ball. Maya's got the ball. Maya brings the ball back. And this other dog comes running over, and I just, you know, have Maya with me, and she keeps coming, and the lady's not paying attention, and she gets right in Maya's face, like, like, like nose to nose, and Maya snapped at her, and the lady's like, oh, you know, whatever, and then the dog went around behind to come behind Maya, and I took my leg and pushed the dog away. Well, two things happened. Well, the one thing, the lady, you know, got the dog away. It was no big deal. And the dog was nice. It was a very nice dog. You know, just saw that, okay, I shouldn't be doing that. It never came back and bothered me again. And some older lady, you know, who was very sweet, had a 15 year old dog, the cutest little old poodle. And I, I love old dogs. And she said to Janet, you know, he shouldn't have kicked that dog. And I didn't kick the dog. I used my legs to move the dog away, but that's what happens. That's this, this, this animal nutcase rights situation where, you know, oh, he used his foot on the dog. Well, you know, I mean, that's all I had. Because with my hand, I was holding my dog. And I was trying to keep the other dog from coming again on my dog. Um, well, did I have a question? Was I talking about a question here? Or am I totally sidetracked? Um, training dogs off leash, I think, at the park is what we're talking about. Um, oh, distractions, yeah. So you just work through them. That, that, and, that, and there's your answer. You know, I work through them all the time. And I actually kind of like it. I do. Um, who am I looking at? Ollie. Okay, when you, okay, I want to try to stay focused on rescue today. I'm going to take this as the last one, but let's, let's try to stay focused on rescue. When you use e-collar for leash reactivity, do you correct the fixation after conditioning or do you use the, do you use the, do you use the I guess, e-collar for a directional tool? I, I don't understand your question. Um, do you use it to, to correct the fixation? I mean, I'll tell you what I do. Is I, this, the, in the situation that I use an e-collar for dog aggression is I teach the dog not to, to, I teach the dog to look at me, I teach the dog to sit, I teach the dog to come without the e-collar, right? And this is why e-collars are such a great tool. They can be used so many different ways. I don't want you to think that mine is the only way. There's a lot of great ways to use the e-collar. Um, I like using it for, I teach the dog, hey, 
look at me. And the dog doesn't. And I can go, no, bop, 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 which is like tap, tap, tap on your shoulder or push, push, push on your shoulder. And you turn around, you look at me and that's it. I can do that at a distance. That's what I use it for. When I use it as an aversive, and I do use it as an aversive, for example, rattlesnake avoidance training is one of the most powerful tools you need rattlesnake avoidance training if you live in certain areas of the country, like here or Arizona. And there, it's purely a negative. In other words, you see that dog, that, that rattlesnake, and you, you're, getting, you're getting, it's pain. Because getting bit by a rattlesnake is either pain or death. And that's it. That's it. Okay, hang on. This one here's I see one. Is this from Daisy? Is that the one you're gonna give me? I think I might be ahead of you. How do you teach a rescue dog not to pee on area carpets? Well, you crate the dog, right? This is what I'm talking about. That when you first get your rescue dog home, oops, when you first get your rescue dog home, you must crate the dog. Remember, this dog is used to in a shelter peeing wherever it wants to pee. Where it's pooping wherever it wants to poop, to expect anything less. If you bring a rescue dog home and you expect this dog to not do that, you're insane. You're really setting your dog up for failure. Who? AJ. Okay, where's AJ? Red. I have a one-year-old golden and she's constantly jumping on people and she's a little fearful. Do you have any tips on how to deal with this? Yeah, I have a video on that that teaches you how to teach your dog not to jump on people. Um, you, you use a line and, you know, first of all, don't let people approach your dog. Don't let people come up and start petting your dog or talking to your dog or anything like that. Cause it gets the dog excited. And if the dog is fearful and you're trying to engage the dog, it's confusing to the dog. Confusion is one of the cruelest things we do to a dog. Confusion is mean. Put a line on the dog. Let the dog drag the line. When the dog comes up to you, step on the line, the dog uh, 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 can't jump and it, it learns not to jump. It's a, it's a learned behavior. Which one am I looking at? Tommy, Tommy Zahinin Ugalam, Ugum, Ugum. Hi, Ian. Who's Ian? Oh, ha, hi, I, I am. Watch your typing, please. Uh, I'm planning on getting a Rottweiler puppy. I'm from India. Could you please advise me if I have a Rottweiler with kids around? You can have any dog with kids around, you know? Um, I don't think there's any breed that you can't have with kids. I think you should think about the personality of that dog, right? You must understand that a Rottweiler, and again, I've seen Rottweilers that are super high drive, that are like crazy. They need, they, they, I wouldn't put them around kids. And I've seen Rottweilers that are just great with kids. They're just low drive and chill. It depends on the dog. Don't make the mistake um, you know, of that. Let's see here. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm not going to answer. It. I'll do another session on e-collar um, in, in, in another. I just don't want to go into that right now. Um, so I'm looking through here. Any other questions? Um, okay, I, I'm kind of scrolling through here. Okay, let's see here. It's Jill Yakowenko. I have a black shepherd that was from an accident litter from someone. We got him as a pup. We also have a mixed guy from the Humane Society. I can't really tell the difference whether one is more loving than the other, and I know my shepherd is truly attached, but my little rescue is surely very special. And that's a great statement, Jill. And that's the same thing that, you know, Janet used to always say. Janet had Dwayne, uh, sorry, she had Jimmy, and uh, before that she had Bosman, and she loved Bosman. And because there's, I think what, what what's unique about the rescue is, one, you have a savior complex, right? You feel like you saved this dog from impending doom, which is a really nice feeling. And it's a really good thing to do. The second piece is you, do, you know you'll never get another dog like that, right? Like in other words, if I have Goofy, for example, I can breed Goofy and get another dog that's similar to Goofy. I know the genetic lines of the dog. I can kind of say, okay, this is what I want. And I can, I can kind of somewhat replicate it. But when I look at Boz, I'm looking at a picture of him right here. I, I don't know. He was a dachshund mixed with something that had a year of experience before Janet got him. And we don't know what that was. So you can't replicate it. So there is this unique factor about a rescue dog that you will never, never, ever, ever be able to replicate. Now, no dog will ever be duplicated, right? Like in other words, I'll never get another Goofy. Stoop said, you know, he goes, I feel sorry for your next dog. It's not going to be like Goofy. And I understand what he means by that but I can kind of 
replicate it. I can kind of get something similar because I know that. So the beauty of the rescue dog is this is your one shot, right? This is like, you know, you know the, the, the person you're married to. That's the only one like that. You can't go back to the parents and go, hey, would you mind making another one like her? You know, you, you can't do it. Just Jen staring at me. I'm not even looking, but right here, right off camera, there's a, a, a blonde bombshell staring at me and just going like, I get that all the time, by the way. Get it all the time. So, yeah, good question, Jill. Um, let's see. Let's go back down here. Um, by the way, if you haven't picked up one of my um, hoodies, these are really cool. Everybody really loves them. Um, they take a long time to ship. I'm sorry. So um, I, I would start, I would order now because um, it, they, they take a long time to ship. Evil Roy says, my rescue mixed breed just passed Christmas Day. I'm sorry. I got him five months old, and he was almost 17, still crying. Evil um, I, or Roy, I'm sure I shouldn't call you evil. You might just be evil. You might, your name probably Roy. Um, I feel for you. I really do. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's terrible. But God bless you for rescuing a dog. Okay, this is for Rachel. Let me get evil off of here. Rachel Jasper. Yeah, okay. Thoughts on huskies. I saw, recent, I saw recently there's a lot of them in shelters right now. Thank you so much for everything you do. Um, huskies are they're very beautiful dogs, um, but they're also, they can be a little hard to live with. You know, huskies are, are a really high drive dog. They're um, a very primal dog. Huskies are prime, the most primal of the breeds, they say, that um, they're, they're, their DNA is most closest to the wolf. They're, they're more... I don't want to say feral, but they're less like because they're runners. They like to run. They do these things. Um, but if you can kind of manage it, then you can certainly um, you can certainly have a nice dog, you know. But again, don't go. You know, the, we tend to, of course, because of you know our, our vain nature. The first thing we see is is the dog beautiful, and you know that's you know I mean it's, that's what we pick we pick it in partners we pick it in dogs so I'd be real careful I would just you know I would really think about a husky that's in a shelter because there's probably a reason why they're in a shelter um, but they're beautiful they're really pretty dogs Monica how do you feel about foster homes for shelter dogs you know that is what I think is one of the best things because when you get a dog out of the shelter and into a foster home you're actually starting to see that dog how it's going to be in a home and you're reintegrating the dog back into society from the from the shelter and it's it's critical i think it's a really great 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 thing i wish more shelters worked with fosters and and fo you know god bless fosters because it's something i could never do i get way too bonded and way too you know involved in the dog and, and in love with the dog I, I can't i can't i can't foster so if you can foster you are one of the greatest people on the planet honest to god because that's what it takes Dennis? There's no Dennis. Oh, Dennis. I got an Anatolian from a shelter two years old, extremely timid around anyone. How can I make her not so timid? So the easiest way to get a dog not to be timid is to not let them be in the situation that makes them timid in the beginning. Now, that's a totally positive only trainer answer. But what you want to do is you want to limit the dog's exposure. And the way I do that is not by not bringing the dog around people, but I tell people, I'm training this dog. Don't look at the dog. Don't talk to the dog. Don't touch the dog until the dog feels like there's nothing expected of the dog. You can't correct a dog out of timidity. Is timidity a word? Yeah, Jan is very smart. She knows, she knows words, I don't know. Um, you can't rescue or you can't train a dog out of timidity. That's, that's impossible to do. So I like to give the dog exposure. I like to hand feed the dog. I like to feed the dog only outside, take the dog out in, you know, in, in a somewhat uh, populated area, start to get the dog used to that, hand feed, hand feed, hand feed, get the dog out um, with a little bit more people, get the dog out with, you know, a little bit more and, and go really gradual and limit your time. Anything with these kind of behavioral things, you want to limit the time factor because it's a short exposure. I'll give you a great example. Yesterday when I went to the park, um, I took our three dogs. I don't think any of the three dogs was out for more than seven to 10 minutes training. And I literally got there, Goofy went out, Dwayne went out, Maya went out. I got back in the car. I was back in the car in an hour. And, and that's really a great training day for the dogs, right? Because overdoing it, and when I, you know, you go to the, the, the park and you're out there and then you're playing Frisbee, then you're training the dog, then you're talking to people and dogs on a leash. It's a lot for the dog. 
right? It's, it's not a socialization. It's a training thing. So during training, we want it to be short. So if I can take the dog out of the kennel, train, put the dog in the kennel and leave, and then later come back and do it again, the dog learns more than training and doing something else and then doing something else and then doing something else and then doing it because it's overburdening for the dog. F figure, figure out what you want to teach the dog and then go with it. War dog. Oh, warthog. I said war dog. War dog would be a good name. I was going to copy that and I watch. What do you suggest for someone trying to get into training without a dog? I'm unable to get a working dog due to living space and would love to get into training. I mean, I, I don't know what kind of training you want to get into. Um, I mean, you certainly could, you know, a shameless uh, plug here for my shelter dog training course. You could take an online course and really learn a lot of the scholastic things that you need to know. But um, eventually, I need to work with a dog. I mean, if you want to do um, bite work, you could probably get somebody to, um, you know, have you learn how to take bites on dogs. But um, I would, I would certainly st start to um, get, get, you know, get some experience about knowing the behaviors of dogs. Um, Blissful canine, good to see you over here. Um, okay, here's Zizi Chang. I rescued a five or six month Malinois from a shelter, and I found out she has half German Shepherd dog. But her appearance, just like Malinois, we went through house training, crate training. I think, I don't know if you said any more from that, but um, that's very good. And, you know, a lot of times, I mean, those characteristics are real similar between Mal's and German Shepherds. But um, just give the dog all the training you can because they will train very similarly. You'll probably have an easier time with a, Ger with a Malinois that has a little German Shepherd in it, although I'm against mixing the breeds personally. Ooh, oh, Sam? I have my first shift at a shelter tomorrow. Thanks for your course. It was the push I needed to get in there and help. Well, that's fantastic. So that, I love hearing that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'm glad. Do me a favor, though. A lot of you guys give me these great comments here on YouTube about the shelter course. Go back to the shelter course and write a comment. Write a testimonial so people know how great it is. Um, I, I've heard nothing negative. You know, I have a money-back guarantee on my this is something you should know. If you join my online dog training, either the regular uh, training, the monthly training, or the shelter dog course, I have a money-back guarantee. I don't want your money if you're not happy. And I have tons and tons and tons of free dog training available on YouTube. I mean, close to a 1,000 videos. I also have a ton of content on my website that is very, very inexpensive. We're actually, in a, we're, because of a, lo a lot of expenses, we're, we're raising the rates on Mondays. If you want to join, join now, because once you're trained, you, once you're locked in, you're locked in. We never raise rates on members. Um, but if you don't like it, try it out for a few days. You know, look through it. If you don't like it, get your money back. I don't care. I, I am not about keeping your money. Same thing for the shelter. The shelter course is kind of expensive, um, but it's worth it. I can guarantee you it's worth it. And if it's not, you um, get your money back. Pipe organ. My 21-month-old lab, his ability to pay attention just keeps growing with age. How much maturity, how much is maturity versus training? A lot. Um, and that's why I say I don't like to overcorrect puppies. Puppies need to develop. You know, just like children. Children need to develop, and you can't um, squash that. You know, when you have a young child, I, I always have this argument with people. And I had it the other night with Stoops and, and, and uh, my wife where I said, I detest when people say to somebody else, you can do anything in the world you want to do. But that's not true. That's not true. You cannot do, I cannot go on stage and sing with Keith Urban. I mean, I can, but I'm going to look like an idiot. You know, we live in a society where we kind of tell kids, oh, you can do anything you want to do. There's, th that's a lie, right? It's like taking a kid who, and I talked about this with um, Frank Phillips, who's going to be um, out here visiting me in a couple of weeks, who's you know, one of the most amazing uh, competition IP, IGP trainers and competitors in the world. And he said, take a kid and teach him karate for a few years. And when he's 16, put him against a 27-year-old UFC fighter and see what happens. He's going to get killed. And that destroys the kid, right? And that destroys the dog. So we need to build the confidence in the dog without putting him against a challenge that's going to squash him. With a child, we build the confidence, we, and we don't put them in a situation where they're going to get crushed and failed. 
At that point, okay, now this is the pivotal point. If, if, you, if you take nothing out of this live chat but this, this, this is a game changer, and I hope Janet will help me remember this because I want to make a video on just this one topic. At that pivotal point when you see the culmination of the ability and the training, at that point you see where that dog is or where that child is. At that point you have to make a determination. Can you go further? Goofy couldn't go further based on the way he was trained and the, way, the people who I had helping me. And I took him out. And that child at 18 or so, 16, 17, 18, I'm going to know, can this, dog, can this child go to the UFC? Can this child be a boxer, a heavyweight boxer? Because if they can't, and I tell them they can, they will die. They will get, a ni- they will get hurt, really, really hurt. And it's, I'm using the martial arts analogy because that's what I worked in for many, many, many years. You have to protect the dog and you have to protect the child. That's critical. We'll get another question. Oh, we've we got to start wrapping it up here. Michelle, um, could you just say a few words about teaching, helping an easily stimulated dog to settle? So the, the mistake people make with high energy dogs in trying to get them to calm down is the person's energy level becomes more and more excited or frustrated as the dog doesn't do what they want them to do. And this is another great piece. So, so the, here's two uh, tidbits that you can take out of here that, that are worth with their weight in gold. When a dog is excited and you become overcorrecting or overstimulated or over frustrated, it just serves to make the dog more frustrated, excited, or stimulated. Your energy level will change the dog's energy level. So if you can get the dog to feed off of your energy, which they guarantee do, that's just what they do, you must calm down. So the more the excited the dog gets, the calmer and chiller I get. And that's, that's the biggest secret. Sam? You, you and Larry and my f- are my favorite trainers. You said you, you and Larry and my favorite trainers are my favorite trainers. You, would you feel comfortable name dropping a couple others you like? I've heard you mention Will Atherton. Um, you know, I don't know Will. I mean, I certainly think, you know, we, we've emailed a couple times and I like him. Um, but the people I like, I mean, it, it, it just really depends. I mean, obviously, Stoops is my, my, my brother from another mother. I mean, he's, but he does not, he's never titled a dog. He has no idea on obedience like that. It's not his thing. Um, on obedience, my guru, I would look to Frank Phillips. I love Frank. I think Frank is the, is the goat. Um, that's my opinion. That's the person I would turn to. Um, and then if you want to look online, I would look at somebody like Peter Sherrick. You know, I don't know I've never been, I've never watched him train. I've listened to him. I've talked to him. His philosophies are really good. Um, but, and, you know, he's world champion. So that's it. I don't, I don't really know. I don't, I don't, I don't really have a lot of trainers I look to. Um, you know, like Larry's good. Larry's, uh, you know, an online trainer like me. Um, I, and I don't think he is really in the competitive world. I don't think that's not his thing. He's really, you know, he's good with the e-collar. He's good with, you know, helping people and, and does tons of seminars. And people love his seminars. And I love, I love Larry as a buddy too. Who? Nino. You know, Nino's another good online guy. You know, he does um, a lot of stuff with Malinois. You know, and I was just on his show. Um, Nino and I really hit it off as far as talking about stuff. And um, very, very wise guy too. Who? Sissy. Oh, Sissy. Yep, Sissy Chang. One thing is that how can I get my German Shepherd and Malinois dog to hi with other dogs without growling? Oh, I used to say hi with other dogs without growling. Um, Don't. Don't. You know, here's the thing. If your dog growls when it says hi to another dog, what you want to do is keep the dog at a distance from those other dogs until that behavior subsides. Because if your dog is growling at another dog and then you go to correct the dog for doing that, then you're going to trigger the dog into um, an into aggression, right? You want to, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't correct the dog if she does that, but I wouldn't put her in that position. If a dog gets in front of my dog and I need to move him away, I'm going to correct him away. But if my dog has issues around other dogs and growls at other dogs, like you're saying your your dog does, then just don't let them get in front of other dogs. It's going to be the last question because I got to Linda McManus. Which best your shelter training course or regular course? What's the difference besides price? Um, that's really the greatest question to end on. Um, 
the shelter dog course is a course that's really cut out for people who want an in-depth understanding of canine behavior, right? An in-depth understanding of how dogs think, how they train, because the shelter dog training course is 50% lecture and class and 50% in the field, in the yard, and it's all done with shelter dogs. It's done with completely untrained dogs, and we're not really looking at flashy obedience at all. The shelter dog training course is a course on canine behavior of untrained dogs. It's a, a course in understanding canine behavior from a theoretical as well as a practical hands-on application. If you want to completely understand dogs and understand how they tick and how they work, that's a course for you. It's a course. Now, the monthly training is monthly training of pet dogs that, you know, that I've worked with or my dogs or clients' dogs. We deal with aggression, we deal with toys, we deal with um, trick training, we deal with competitive obedience, we deal with um, just p- basic problem solving and a host of other things. It's a super easy course. You, you know, you sign on, um, you know, usually people stay on for about a year or so. And um, there's 170 plus lessons now, there's 60 hours of training. Um, you're, you're not going to get a better value at, at, ever for, for, for dog training and than that. So Guys, on that, I got to wrap it up. So I'm going to ask you, if you want to check out more of my online training, go to robertcabral.com. Um, the link to everything is there. All my podcasts are there. All my, my courses there. My, my online training is there. All my swag, my cool gear, my hats, everything else you can get there. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me. Please be sure you subscribe to this channel. Hit the notification bell so that I can send you an alert before I do these live chats. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care.